Here we are, another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I am your host, Fadi Kudair, with Sutton Ottawa Group. And today we've got one of my new friends, I'm going to say. Yes. Yasser Ghazi. He is the Director of Commercial Services at Meridian Bank. Correct. And the whole reason we brought Yasser on the show, it's actually not just because of the fact that we're doing commercial banking, but there's also a little bit other segment to it that I'm going to let you kind of lead to it. Sure. With. Which is, first off, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really oh, appreciate absolutely. it, man. My pleasure. Talk to me about the 40 Under 40. Sure. So the 40 Under 40 is an award that's been going on for a few years now where basically they try to, um, they try to, how do I say this? They try to point out 40 people who are mm -hmm. under the age of 40 who have uh, exemplified business success as well as community uh, involvement and um, kind of like are just overall, I guess, successful in what their, their endeavors are. Yeah. So uh, you get nominated for it. And then there's usually about like 2,000 nominees or so, I believe, in the city. And then 40 people win. So it's a yearly thing. Amazing. And how do you, like, just for folks yeah. that are watching, how do you get nominated for something like that? So it's the Ottawa Business Journal that runs it in collaboration with the Ottawa Board of Trade. Yeah. And there is an online application form that basically goes through, like, your resume and what have been your successes throughout your career up to this point. What's your most successful at, at like in this career point that you're in now as well, and what you do in your community and so on. So either somebody nominates you and they fill that out, or you, I think, can nominate yourself as well. Amazing. And just a question on that. Yeah. My understanding from a, from a while back was this is mostly for people that are in business Correct. for themselves. Yeah. But it sounds like it's not necessarily just business for yourself. It's really more. I think it's expanded beyond that. Yeah. yeah. Like I th I think there's probably. If I was a judge and you have these many applicants, you have to choose 40. Oh, God, help us if you're a judge. Yeah, right? <laughs> Plus it depends who's going to win. And then so it's like, but if you're really choosing ones, like it's almost, it's not almost easier to see, but yeah. like it, you can really speak to the success or the, the impact that you have in your own company versus somebody else's company. So I think it's it has to be really a collaborative effort with whoever's nominating you mm -hmm. to really try to encapsulate kind of like what have you done in your career? Because it's not just in your job. So, for instance, I remember in my application process, it was like a lot of discussion. Okay, well, how did you start out in banking? So I went back when I was 22, and this is what I did. This is what I was successful in. This is how long till I got my next promotion. This is when I got headhunted for this company, and so on and so forth. So I think showing all that shows success in your field, whether you're an employee, whether you're a government worker or anything. I think if you could show a path and a journey that speaks to kind of like the things that they look for, yeah, um, then it's a, it's a good candidacy. It's amazing. What an honor. I think it's, uh, it's a huge honor. It speaks volumes to, you know, what you've been doing in the banking. And uh, that's actually my next segue is like, sure. <laughs> tell me a little bit more about commercial banking. Yeah. This is one of the reasons we, we wanted mm -hmm. to kind of bring this up is because, you know, I, I like to highlight a lot of businesses in the city yeah. uh, and bring out, you know, value to the, the consumer out there that are watching and just to, to see, you know, what else is in, in Ottawa? What can we do? Sure. What's available? So let's talk a little bit more about commercial banking. What's that yeah. like? Commercial banking has been something that I've been involved in since I was 25. Wow. So I've been kind of really involved Dating in yourself. it. Yeah, so I'm 35 now. So it's been 10 years that I've been just in the commercial banking space. Started out in small business and moved on up. There's a difference. I'll explain it quickly. Small business is usually if there's an ask, for most banks, if your ask as, an, uh, as a business is for a loan or something less than a million bucks. Mm -hmm. Anything above goes to commercial. And then there's levels in commercial. There's like mid-market, which is between a certain amount and a certain amount. There is, um, I forget the name of it anyways, but like there's a, the, the starter mid-market, and then there's like private commercial net worth kind of things, which yeah. is like a Starbucks or a Walmart would deal with. So it really depends which area you fall in, what you can get, the access to different products and so on. But ultimately what it is, you're helping business owners you're a business owner, so I would be helping you accomplish something, whether that's your day-to-day -day banking, positive growth, so if you're like, hey, I'm sitting on some wealth, what can I do with it? Yeah. Or above that is if you need lending to buy the studio space, buy the building, uh, go buy equipment to do your business with, right? Like, so if you're a manufacturer, that might be what you need. Um, so ultimately, that's in its nutshell what commercial banking really is. And I know, it, uh, you know, dealing with commercial real estate in general yep. and dealing with residential, it's a whole different ballgame between the two. 
Yep. The same probably goes with banking. It's probably a lot different. I know with, for example, for residential, it's really all depending on your job, your right. income, right. and the crazy Period. credit score yeah. thing that we're, we're all looking at. But yeah. what is it like for commercial? Like, what are you guys looking at? What sort of the nuances that so depends. take place? Yeah, and this is, I won't say a mistake, but this is a uh, misconception a lot. It's not just the, the hey, I'm buying this property, this is how much the rent's going to be. We're great. No, if you're going the commercial banking route where you're dealing with a bank or a credit union like we are, it's we look at the business as a whole. So how is your business doing? What's the viability of that? Okay, we look at the asset. Mm -hmm. We look at what the market rents are going to be like. Does it actually make sense? Does, does the building that service itself? But let's say you have a lot of other properties in that. Does that also, is that also debt servicing? Is that asset going to now need the money from this asset to help it because it's not doing well. Yeah. So we really look at the entire picture. So it would make total sense to like, you know, if you have an asset that's a little bit sort of hindering your balance sheet, maybe just get rid of it or- Get rid of it or, or put, put it everything in its own holding company. Yeah. So you kind of want to manage everything separately. There's giving a lot of information is good to your banker. Using all of it is not always necessary. So it's kind of good to know, this is my entire picture. What's relevant, what's not? How do we ensure that- you know, because it happens. Like you've seen what happened in the markets yeah. over the past year, right? Rates jumped like crazy. Some assets were in, uh, you know, interest only payments and a private loan now needs to get refinanced at a much higher rate. Well, it doesn't debt service. Exactly. Right. So then what happens if it's in its own kind of bubble and you could kind of control that, that's one thing. If it's all interrelated, that's an issue because we're going to look at it all. And then we're going to see what's the risk of that property hurting our property and our asset. Mm -hmm. The security part of things, meaning like what we have a lien against, we could put that against just the one property, leave everything else alone, but we have to look at the health of the business. So kind of keep each business on its own. It's better from a liability standpoint too. So let's go back a little bit. I want to yeah. let the folks know when you first started back in sure. 10 years ago, what was that like? What's commercial banking looked like back then? It's completely different. It was, uh, so I started out in a financial institution that was very popular. When I started out, I had 4,000 clients, just myself, mm -hmm. that I inherited. I didn't build that. So I was dealing with, uh, I remember my first day, I didn't have an office yet. I joined, I was just sitting down at the branch waiting for my office. And then uh, somebody walked up, was like, hey, somebody's here to talk about business banking. I'm like, cool, who's, who's gonna talk to them? And they're like, you're the business guy, now you gotta go. So I had to go into an office that's not mine, I don't have email yet, and just kind of try to figure it out. So it was very fast paced, a lot of people, small business is, 10 times the amount of people that you'll see in commercial banking at a level of a million dollars plus. What I'm trying to say is like, everybody who might have a side business is a small business client. Correct. Everybody who's somewhat growing is a small business client. And there is a, I'm not really sure about the statistic yeah. exactly, but I think it's like around 80 or something. 80, yeah, 5% or so yeah. of the GDP is coming, coming from, from small, small business. business. It's this the backbone. Sub million. Yeah, and it's really like, what I loved about it is that you really got to see all I'm affecting this person's life. Yeah. It's not just their business. Yeah. Because and that's, that's a thing too. Like when you're a small business at that level, it's like your life revolves around that business. hundred percent. In a nutshell. Yeah. And if the business doesn't do well, you don't get to eat. Yeah. Right. And your family suffers. And your family that lent you the money. Correct. It's coming okay. after you. So coming it's like, after <laughs> you. you're, you're losing family. Not yeah, business, yeah. 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 Everything. Everything is intertwined. So it's completely different than having like a, a larger company where there's shareholders, there's like investors who are maybe affected and obviously employees, but it's not really like that tangible. Yeah. Like when you meet the CEO. So I love that about it. But it's also like the the hard part about it because back then you you are your business. So now we're looking at your personal income. We're looking at a lot of things that are not business related. So we really, you are your business and everything's kind of riding on you, much like residential. Yeah where it's your credit score, how well you've done, how well you've managed your personal finance, that will speak to, can you handle your business finances? Now move that into like a commercial banking space where we're like saying, okay, now you're beyond that. Can your business manage everything while still paying you? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the way that we look at it. We look at you two separate entities instead of one. But really like it was, it was thriving. People were coming out all the time with new ideas. It was very, there was a lot of motivation for innovation, which was huge. That was like when Invest Ottawa started coming up. That's when all these kind of initiatives, even from the city, started coming up. Yeah. As telling people like, no, we want you to innovate, do something different. Right. So it was it was really nice and it was really healthy and you got to meet a lot of different types of 
businesses, which allow you to be able to speak to a lot of different types of businesses, right? So it was, uh, it was really nice back then. Amazing. And so you started there. What did you do next? What was right, so, the evolution? Yeah, part of my personal evolution was that uh, I'm a competitive guy. Like I played sports all my life and stuff. So one of the things is I started out in small business and, again, in a really powerful brand. So then I kind of wanted to be, in a, and I became successful in my second year. My first year I was in performance enhancement plan. I was mm -hmm. in PIP. So I was just like, I'm still figuring it out. Figured out the way I should approach things. And then I became really successful in my second year. And then I was like, okay, is it the brand or is it me that made me successful? At the same time, another financial institution came by and saying, hey, we're coming up with a pilot program for business development managers. Basically, can you go out there, hunt for a commercial banking business, bringing it to the branch and giving it to the advisors? So you're not managing anybody. Can you just go out in there and get it? So I thought, okay, this is a good way to test. Is it me or is it the brand? It was a little bit of a different financial institution and so on. So I said, okay, let's do it. So I kind of took a little gamble because it is a pilot program. And I was like, oh, I might be out of a job in a year. But it was successful first year. So they extended us for another year. Successful. Became nationwide. So I was involved with the hiring process for that. Hussein, who you've met before, yeah. I actually met him then. So I helped hire him for that role. And it was successful and it was good. But then I was also for a bank, one of the big five. So to me, it was like, okay, like, can I kind of do it all? Like, is it me or is it still the brand that's helping? At the same time, Meridian came knocking and there was a new role called regional manager business banking, which was to help them grow their deposit book. So I was like in day-to-day -day banking stuff. So I said, okay, it's not loans. Can I do this? So then I said, uh, actually me and my boss, who you know, Rafiq, great guy, we kind of tested each other. I remember our interview was 30 minutes long. And I was very relaxed like this. And I was just like, this is the way I work. I don't want to be managed this way. I don't want to be managed that way. It's either you trust me or you don't. And he's like, I don't want to manage that way. It's either I trust you or I don't. I said, great, hear from you. And then we walked away. And it took him like two months of him going to different events to see if I'm actually there or if I'm just talking. And then he was like, okay. Like he, he does what he speaks. So now I can trust him and I came on board. So that happened and then COVID hit. Yeah. And we were all stuck at home mm -hmm. and nobody wanted to move their business banking anywhere. Nobody wanted to buy a house. Nobody wanted to sell a house. Everybody was just on standstill. So I kind of, in my head, I was like, okay, how do I shift? So how can I support my team? Let me support them with the admin and with the loans, putting together the, the write-ups and stuff. Like, let me take some stuff off their books. Started doing that. Uh, it was kind of noticed. Then I got uh, promoted into the director role. And then a year later, got promoted into the director team lead role, which is like I managed a, a larger team that way. And yeah, so that's kind of been my history. Amazing, man. So we're going back to the commercial banking just yeah, to, uh, again, commercial is, is vast. It's not like a small little, you know, uh, drop in the bucket. Like when you're buying residential, it's really just as simple as can I fit? Can this work? Yep. The finance work. Great. Let's do it. And there's a lot of emotions involved on the, on the buyer side and the of seller course. side, obviously. Yep. But when it comes to commercial, it's a lot more uh, at stake. And then there's a lot more different categories of commercial. Yep. What do you guys deal with at Meridian or specifically in your role? Like what sort Everything. of- Everything. Okay, so tell like, me more. Like that's the thing, commercial banking for <laughs> us, it's not very segment specific. We try to divide our team into two. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is we have one team that takes care of construction development. So if you're a builder, so you're not gonna be living in it or using it, um, then we'll kind of send you one route. There's two people on my team on that who are fantastic. Alex, who is um, like comes from Colony Bridgeport, so he's he was an analyst for a developer, so he really yeah. understands the world. And Mayada, who's been doing banking forever, great people. So they kind of manage that side. My side of the business does everything else. So if you're a manufacturer, you need equipment. We're there to finance you. If you're buying a building to operate out of, we're there to finance you. If you're buying, if you need a line of credit for operational, we're there to help you. Doesn't really specifically matter about the industry. Doesn't matter about the product. Doesn't matter as long as it makes sense. Yeah, we're there to help you. Uh, so that also involves, for example, if someone is buying an office or if someone is buying a, everything. A, a property or yep, pretty much everything. Everything that's commercial. So if you're buying a commercial property, com a church is seen as commercial. So if you're building a church, we would be the ones who are helping you. If you are literally anything involved with Have you a done business, a church lately? yeah, oh yeah. Talk to me about that project. Oh, it's complicated. Uh, you don't have to give me names. You don't have to give me any churches. Just nope. like so, tell me a little bit more about how did yeah, you guys yeah. put it together. The biggest concern about a church is income. Two things, actually. 
one, you never want to take over a church and say they haven't been paying their bills, okay? You'll get somebody mad. So you don't want to do that. The second aspect is income. It's all donations. So how do you ensure consistency of income? Mm -hmm. If we know a business is doing some sort of work to get some sort of revenue, you could see it predicted. So you have to approach it a little bit differently. So what, the way I did it was we usually take two-year financial statements and we base it off that. How does each year look? Is it getting better or worse? Blah, blah, blah. I went eight years and I just showed that donation base has been consistent within a 10% margin within the last eight years. So we have to go with the idea that going forward, it's going to continue to do. We have to be a bit more due diligence, but that's kind of the way that we did it. Lucky thing about churches is they also don't have a lot of expenses and they don't have taxes and stuff like that that they have to pay. Yeah. So it's very minimal. It's very like missions if they're doing it, which they can or cannot, and salaries for the people working there, mm -hmm. which is usually like one or two or three. A lot of people are volunteers. So the nice thing is like it's very controlled and all the donations can go towards something. It's usually to keep run things afloat building, and yeah. run the building and run so on and be able to, you know, uh, sponsor something or go out there and get, you know, preach of some sort. But I flipped it and we just said, okay, well, here's what we can do. The second hard part, uh, sort of the third hard thing is the asset itself. So is it a church looking church? A lot of people now are going kind of away from the traditional look and will go more for like um, almost like an event hall space type yeah. church because they want to do both. They also want people to come in and do events and so on, right? For the it's, it's a good revenue generator. Hundred percent. Right? Yeah, it brings in a lot more. Uh, you know, hosting a wedding, hosting a right. something. And now we can show there's a business aspect. Exactly. Here, right? yeah. And then, what's your congregation like? How many often are not married? Like we could have these kind of questions that you're sort of putting together a the probability of this being has just decreased, of it being a failure or uh, the people not being invested in yeah. it uh, for success. Honestly, I see it as one of the safest businesses because for me, it's like no matter what, like it's, I grew up in the Middle East, like it's, it's religion is always around you and you don't second guess it. It's part of your culture. Mm -hmm. And people who are church goers, synagogue goers, mosque goers, that's part of their culture. So you, it's not like, oh, I'm getting out of it. It's more of just my involvement. It's usually, if you're not going to be involved in practice of attending, you're involved in monetary, so you don't feel that. So I actually always think money's always going to come in. Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. like, that's kind of the way I look it's, at it's it. It's like the, the lesser of both, you know. 100%. At least I'm, I'm I donated. donating. Yeah, at least I, I donated. I a little bit better about yeah. Right? I might not be able to come on Friday prayers, but I donated. You yeah. know what I mean? So it's one of those things. I, I help put those two blocks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. like, it, it, it is there, right? So, so it's a bit different. So once you showed a large enough sample size... Oh, you heard it here first, guys. This yeah. is the guy that financed the church. <laughs> That's right. And then so it's, uh, but once you've shown enough sample size and yeah. that you could kind of make sense of it, that you could take some of the worries away, you're still going to have some credit underwriters that don't want to do it or have had bad experiences with it. So Correct. you kind of got to be careful with like who's reviewing it and underwriting it. But if you show enough consistency, then. Well, the other thing too is there was this like fad for the last, I want to say five or six years where people are buying old churches. And, and renovating them. Renovating them into like, um, you know, one of my friends actually bought it and renovated it as a house. Yep, happens all the time. And it's it's a, one of those like nice looking houses. And then, then some that are like, okay, well now we're going to do it as a studio or this or that. So like, I can understand why the underwriters might have that sort of hesitation. Honestly, it's better if they're if it's able to be converted. Like the issue is, okay, the church doesn't pay. We take over. What now? Like if it's a, it, if it's a traditional looking church, you think only another church can buy it. So now our sample size is a lot smaller. Yeah. How many churches have money to buy it and blah, blah, blah. So it's like, it's a little bit different, but there has been a lot. Like uh, there's one in Vanier that's getting changed into a restaurant and Pilates studio and stuff like there's a lot of things going on, but you have to have the right group of people doing it. Yeah. So as long as that becomes a trend that has become successful, because we had people on our credit team is like, I hate church conversions. I've done two and they both did horribly. I'm like, well, they were just two bad ones that you chose. Like I know ones that are very well backed and are doing extremely well, right? So it's, oh, it's always an opinion game. You just got to keep the bias out of it, unfortunately. Exactly. And then that's the thing, too. Like, at the end of the day, it's uh, things are going to change and evolve always, right? So it doesn't matter. Welcome to the world. Ex like, yeah. th that to me is, um, it's the most annoying thing about banking, is that things have been working this way for so long, and we backed these type of people for so long that these are the markers we look for, right? Immigration is more than it ever has been. So you're going to be banking completely different people. 
Again, I come from the Middle East, Egypt, and we don't really deal with interest and stuff there. If you have the money, then you buy it. So this is people learning about loans, about things that are really beyond, right? Yeah. So you're gonna cater to a different audience. You can assume they know it. And inherently, the old way of things were working were somewhat biased towards a specific group of people, right? Like it's like, these are the people who understood the game and how to play. Oh yeah. And this so, actually, like for me, it comes quite often, especially when we're housing, doing rentals, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, a lot of the times people are like, oh, you know, like I just don't want to rent. They don't have any credit history. They don't have this, they don't have that. My backing for it has always been like, if they're Africans or Middle Easterns, I guarantee you they'll pay their house before yeah. they eat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's of just course. based, maybe a little bit biased, but based on what I've seen. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, definitely it's been repeating itself for years. Yeah, the biggest fear is that you miss a payment on loan like that hurts yeah. you. Speaking of churches, that's also the good thing about churches mm -hmm. is that there is a, an inherent, outside the numbers, there is an inherent, we can't fail. Because if we fail, then it looks like our congregation is not strong. Yeah. Or that the religion or this particular church is fail. So that kind of onus, and it's like, I gotta pay that before I eat as a priest or something, like is actually like really in there in the way that you know they're gonna manage your money. How do you prove it? Obviously it's very hard, but like you've seen it with so many things, just like you said. Yeah. If you're most likely, if you're African or Middle Eastern, like speaking for us, it's that, yeah, my, my parents would probably not eat or say, okay guys, we're eating uh, bologna sandwiches again, and yeah. we'd be fine with it if they had to pay a bill. It's, yeah, and it's one of the reasons why like homelessness in Egypt is not as common. No, I mean, not, it is common. Yeah, yeah, it, it yeah. Does, there's a, an aspect of there's it. There's a disparity in economy that's a different correct, scenario. Yeah. Correct, Yeah. Because we'll pay the house before we pay for the food. Yeah. And, you know, we could, we could go and maybe knock on the neighbor's house yeah. and get some food, but yeah, yeah. You and can't knock family. on the neighbor's house and say, I'm gonna stay here. I'm gonna bit. stay, well, you can probably. I would do it. But yeah, the, the community feel is completely different and everything like that is yeah. completely different. So it's it's a really, we don't take that into it. We always say the five C's of credit, right? Like there's uh, something like that that we look into. The only... Let's let's define those for... Oh, for no, let's not because I'm trying to remember them. Right now, but <laughs> the them on the spot character right is one, which is really important. Credit. Uh, credit. Capacity, which is really your ability to borrow. There's only one C of the five that's around money. That's around, can you pay it? But we tend to also focus on that one the most and forget the character, <laughs> the the credit, the history, and all that kind of stuff, which speaks volumes because that's that's what really gives you comfort, yeah. right? You can't control the economy, but you can control how they're going to react in that economy. Yeah, it's the same for us. Like when we're selling a house, it's uh, a lot of the times I tell this to my my sellers all the time. Look, there's three things that are going to take effect into this. Yeah. The first one, the biggest one, is really the economy, and that's normally something that I can't control. Yep. You and I are just going to be fighting over it. We just can't control it. We can't control the competition. We can't control who goes on the on the market yep. next. We can't control what Debbie down the street sold her house for. None of that. Yep. We can't control that you know the interest rate went up or down. But the other two that we can control is you and me. Yeah. What I put in it and what you put in it. Yeah. If we can get those two really down packed, we should be able to at least predict this one. And uh, and that's one hundred percent. That's like basically it. Yeah. And real estate is a, it's a different animal because again, you can only control so much. And uh, like residential to me is a lot more comforting. Mm -hmm. If I buy a house and the value goes down, I'm still living in it. Yeah. So as long as I'm comfortable affording it, doesn't really matter. I could just wait, right? Yeah, it's all a matter of waiting it out. Yeah. It's time, time heals everything. And, everything, and, everything and always, many. yeah, look at the market. Yeah. It does this every day, but it's always going up, right? The trend is this way, it's not mm -hmm. this way. So it's, it's uh, yeah, you just gotta get comfortable with the risk. Or yeah. don't get into it. Well, that's make the, a, make the too, choice, but, right? But it's a, again, it's the risk you're taking, and the same for you guys as, as a bank. It's the risk that you're taking on that client. Yeah, we're very graced by your presence. Really appreciate you, sir. Thank you. And looking forward to more and more and connecting with you uh, across and, and all the networks and, and what have you. For people that are watching, if you like what you see, please don't forget to hit the like button. He's a handsome boy, and then also make sure that you hit the subscribe and, and hit the bell icon, so this way you can get the uh, episodes that we come out, you get alerted about it and at least you know what's coming. Uh, and I normally don't release them all at once. They, they come in, in in chunks. So if you want to watch this or anything else, just make sure that you hit that subscribe and uh, we'll see you soon. Like and subscribe. Appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. No worries. Thank you. Like and subscribe. Yeah.